All right, everybody, I'm going to get started. Well, it's a real pleasure to introduce uh, T.B. Stan um, in his thesis defense. Uh, T.B.'s been here at Santa Barbara for about 10 years. Uh, the first uh, part of that uh, as an undergraduate in the College of Creative Studies, and he actually spent, uh, I think, the winter and spring quarters of the senior year uh, in our group. And he's been a great uh, member of our group ever since uh, in, in all and every way. Great research, great person, and uh, really a, a pleasure to work with. So, so today he's going to tell us about his uh, thesis, uh, now entitled The Role of Metal Oxide Interfaces in Nanostructured Critic Alloys and FEYP PI207 Bilayers. So, Tibby, uh, any introduction? Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you, Bob, for the introduction. Uh, I really want to thank everyone for taking the time to attend my defense today, uh, especially my parents, Marius and Liliana, who are here, and my sister and her boyfriend, uh, who came from the other side of America just for this event. Also, I'd like to thank my girlfriend, Gersharon, and her mom for attending, and uh, everybody else. Um, I want to... Uh, give some special thanks to my advisor, Bob Odette, for supporting me through these past years. And to Yuan Wu, who uh, did a lot of the transmission electron microscopy that I will be showing today. And especially without these two people, none of this would have been possible. So I'm very thankful. Also, I'd like to acknowledge my funding, the Department of Energy Office of Fusion Energy Sciences, who has really funded these projects from start to finish. And today I'll be discussing the role of metal oxide interfaces in nanostructured ferritic alloys and in iron to yttrium titanium oxide bilayers. So to start, I want to discuss energy and the need that we have for electricity. We as a society use a lot of electricity every day, so much that you can see it from space. This is a video taken from the International Space Station, and you can see all the lights from cities, from towns. And as society continues to grow and new towns pop up, convert into cities, and new structures are built, there will always be a need for more and more electricity. In fact, the total world electricity consumption is projected to reach 239,000 terawatt hours by the year 2040. This is a 48% increase from 2012. So these energy needs must be met. And now we have different uh, power plants. But I want to talk about a way of generating electricity that shows a lot of process, of promise, excuse me. And I want to talk about nuclear fusion. So nuclear fusion has some advantages over other uh, ways of producing electricity. One, there is an abundant fuel supply. Deuterium is extracted from seawater and tritium is produced in the reactor itself. So the fuel supplies will be available for millions of years. The fuel is very energy efficient. Just one kilogram of fusion fuel is about the equivalent of 10 million kilograms of fossil fuel. Third, the technology is inherently safe. The fusion reaction ceases in case there is an accident. Fourth, there are no CO2 emissions. So the Technology is very environmentally friendly. And fifth, it is very scalable. So multiple cities can be powered by just one fusion plant. And so to fuse atoms, their nuclei must be brought close enough together such that the attractive nuclear strong force exceeds the repulsive electrostatic force. This process requires extreme temperatures and pressures. So in the sun, the temperatures are so hot and the sun is so massive that atoms are able to fuse. On Earth, 
we don't yet have those capabilities readily available, especially the incredible amount of gravity required. So the reactors work in a slightly different way to achieve these temperatures and pressure. The fusion fuels are deuterium and tritium, uh, which are isotopes of hydrogen. The deuterium nucleus is made of one neutron and one proton. The tritium nucleus is two neutrons and one proton. And by bringing them close enough together such that the repulsive forces are overcome by the attractive forces, helium is produced, and a high-energy neutron uh, exits the system. This high-energy neutron has an energy of 14.1 mega electron volts and is the key to producing heat. So fusion power stations do not exist yet. But there are experiments underway to show that fusion will be a viable way of producing electricity. This is the Eater Tokamak. It's a structure that is currently built in France. And it is seven stories tall. And the goal is to show that you can get 10 times as much power out as you put in. What you see in the middle are uh, deuterium and tritium particles that have been heated up to over 150 million degrees. And they are confined by magnetic fields in this toroidal chamber. It looks like a donut, donut much like the ones you guys are eating right now. <laughs> now this donut is huge. It's about 60 feet wide. And it's so hot that there's currently no material that can physically touch it. So it has to be levitated by magnetic fields. And the process that we are working on here is to develop materials to build this first wall. These structures that have to face the very hot plasma. So from the plasma, these high energy neutrons escape the magnetic confinement and deposit their energy into the first wall and blanket structures. And in a future power reactor, heat is transferred by a water cooling loop to make steam, which will then drive turbines to produce electricity. So in a future reactor, there will be uh, cooling lines that run through the structure that withdraw this heat and spin turbines to produce the electricity. So what we want to know is how can we make materials that face this plasma? And what can we make them out of? And I want to discuss first some of the challenges. So if you have an iron lattice, <clears throat> there are two main uh, effects that can happen due to these neutrons. One is that the neutron will come in and hit uh, a la an iron atom out of its lattice site. This leaves behind a vacancy or a vacant site, and the new iron atom, which does not sit in one of the lattice sites, is referred to as an interstitial. So through an iterative process, this iron atom can then displace other atoms, and you end up with a number of interstitials and vacancies in the material. The second process which is uh, very important for nuclear fusion materials, is that the neutron can interact with the nucleus of the iron. And through a neutron to alpha transmutation reaction, it can produce a significant amount of helium within the structure itself. And this helium is especially bad because it is insoluble. And helium can travel through the lattice find more helium atoms and nucleate bubbles. Now, as more helium is continuously added to the system, the bubbles will grow along with the addition of vacancies and it can turn into voids. So if unmanaged, the combination of radiation damage and helium can lead to growing voids, swelling, embrittlement, and degradation of material properties. 
So here's an example of uh, a material that shows a lot of void swelling. To the right is a video by Stefan Kramer that shows a, a tomograph of uh, voids within the material. And these are especially bad for material uh, performance. You can imagine that as the material, as uh, the voids keep forming, the material begins to swell to unacceptable conditions. And if you have a structure that begins swelling and growing in a power plant, you don't just end up with a bigger power plant. You end up with <laughs> lots of material properties. <laughs> um, so uh, the end of life power reactor goals for these materials are to reach a damage level of 200 displacements per atom, which means that on average, each atom in the lattice was displaced 200 times and a concentration of 2,000 atomic parts per million helium, which is a lot of helium. So the alloys that are being researched here at UCSB are termed nanostructured ferritic alloys. They are strengthened by a high number density of less than four nanometer yttrium titanium oxide face centered cubic type pyrochlor uh, nano oxide features. So in the top right, we see one of these nano oxides with the Y2TA207 chemistry and structure is embedded in an iron chrome matrix. These particles are very small, 1.8 nanometer by 3.8 nanometers. And there's an incredible high number density. They are found throughout the whole material. So the way the nanooxides work is that they trap helium in a very large number of small interfacial bubbles, thereby preventing void swelling and helping to protect grain boundaries. Along with this, the nanooxides and the bubbles act as recombination sites for these point defects. The interstitials and vacancies are able to recombine at these sites and the material is essentially healed. So the video that I'm going to show here, made in collaboration with, uh, or by Peter Wells and Stefan Kramer, shows in blue a data set of showing bubbles. And this was obtained using transmission electron microscopy. In red, you're gonna see the locations of nanooxides taken from atom probe tomography. And you're gonna see that each of these little nanooxide particles has a bubble attached to it. So here are the bubbles. This is a grain boundary. And here are the nanooxides right next to them. This data set was taken from the exact same uh, lift out. So you can see clearly each of the nanooxides has a bubble attached. And this is the kind of behavior that we really like. We don't want helium to get together and make those big voids and lead to swelling. We want helium to be spread out and partitioned through the structure. And there are still questions about these alloys. Um, here I'm showing a nanooxide particle, a small one, a large one, some bubbles attached. And some of the unknowns are, do larger nanooxides have larger bubbles? Can these nanooxides have multiple bubbles attached to them? Is there a preferred bubble nucleation site? So is there a place along this nanooxide where bubbles prefer, prefer to get trapped and form? And is there helium within the little oxides themselves? And this uh, question especially comes from some first principles modeling that suggests that helium may in fact enter the Y2TI207 nanooxides first prior to nucleating the helium bubbles. So we want to see if experimentally we can tell if helium would enter the nanooxide. Also, we are interested in the orientation relationships, meaning these nanooxide crystals, how do they sit inside the iron chrome matrix? 
we want to know if there are misfit strains and core shell structures. And essentially, what is the fate of helium? And how does it partition between the iron, the interface, and the nanooxide? So today I'm going to be discussing two experimental approaches. One is to take a nanostructured ferritic alloy and anneal it to coarsen the nanooxide. This makes them a little bit larger, and it makes it much more easy for us to characterize. Then we implant helium to nucleate the little bubbles. The second approach is to deposit iron on yttrium titanium oxide single crystals and obtain much larger interfaces. So the nanooxides are so small that they're difficult to study, and we are very interested in the interfaces because they're the ones that trap helium. So we want to make a really big interface. And by really big, I mean two millimeters are the sizes that I work with. But for us, that's really big. And here we then implant helium to nucleate bubbles. So there are some similarities and differences between these two systems. For the embedded oxide, the interface size is two to 10 nanometers. While for the depositions, the interfaces are about a thousand times larger. For uh, measuring the amount of helium, we can use energy electron energy loss spectroscopy to look at how much helium is in the bubbles themselves. But this system gives us access to more uh, techniques, especially isotope dilution spectroscopy, which I will discuss later. The amount of strain in the oxides themselves. So it has been reported that for the embedded nanooxides, there is up to 8% compressive strain. So the oxides can be uh, a little bit compressed. The lattices are a little bit compressed when they are in the iron chrome matrix. And they have misfit dislocations at larger sizes. Here, the single crystal oxide is inherently unstrained prior to the iron deposition. But we also see misfit dislocations at the interfaces. And last, regarding the orientation relationships, uh, for the nanooxides, we see cube on cube and edge on cube orientations. Again, this describes how the crystals are sitting within the matrix. <coughs> but here, we mostly see other orientation relationships. So the first experiment is to anneal these alloys. We took a pristine alloy, which has the small, about two nanometer nanooxide. We annealed it at a temperature of 1200 degrees Celsius for 228 hours. And this coarsened the oxides a little bit. They became about two to 10 nanometers. Then we implanted helium to nucleate bubbles. So for the helium implantation, we used one mega electron volt helium plus ions. And these were implanted at the Duet facility at Kyoto University in Japan. This implantation was done by uh, my coworker Takuya Yamamoto. And I want to show what happens when you implant helium. So this video on the top is going to show helium ions being injected from the left to the right. And it's going to show where they stop in the iron matrix. And on the bottom, you're going to see a histogram where all of the ions end up. So at the beginning, uh, the helium enters the lattice and is relatively unperturbed. But at a certain depth, it begins to have uh, scattering interactions. And it, it gets deflected. So what you end up with in the end is a higher concentration of helium, in this case at a depth of about uh, 1.2 microns. So this is the final result of what the implantation profile uh, looks like. So for this experiment, we use the fluent of 4.5 times 10 to the 16 helium atoms per centimeter squared. What that means is that for, for the surface, for a centimeter squared of surface area, 
about 4 trillion helium atoms were implanted into that area. Uh, the implantation time was about 10 hours, and this was done at high temperature, 700 degrees Celsius. And we want high temperature because we want the helium to be able to move throughout the material and find a site uh, where it's going to be permanently trapped. We don't want to put it in and not have it have enough energy to move around. We really want to see where does the helium end up in the end. So this is what we saw. This is a high resolution transmission electron microscopy image taken at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. And this really tells us a lot of information. Now, Chibi, could you turn off the lights for a second? It'd be easier to see that. Um, right. Okay. So, what what we see here is uh, the nano oxides with the Y2 Ti207 structure. This larger one has a cube on cube orientation with the matrix. This one has a cube on edge orientation. And we see lots of bubbles attached, especially to the corners. So we, we learned something new. We see that some nano oxides do indeed have multiple bubbles attached. We also saw that the bubbles generally grow to about 75% of the nano oxide size, as shown by this plot relating the bubble size to the nano oxide size. So there's a general trend. The nano oxide, the larger nano oxides have larger bubbles associated with them. Uh, one of these nano oxides uh, specifically was great for uh, getting a lot of information about the structure of the Y2TI207 this one here, which I have outlined the shape, has a cube on edge orientation relationship. It is about 3.5 nanometers tall and 5.9 nanometers wide, and has two bubbles attached. One that is 2.6 nanometers, and the other one 1.3 nanometers. About the oxide itself, from this image, we were able to tell the actual shape of the particle. We see it has 100 faces, 111 corners, and 110 edges. Importantly, from this, we were able to tell the orientation relationship of each of these interfaces. And again, we are very interested in the interfaces themselves between the oxides and the matrix. So clearly, we're interested in uh, oxide surfaces that are 110 edges, 111 corners, and 100 zero, zero, uh, faces. Also from this, we saw that bubbles nucleate at the 111 corner facets. And they have what's, what's known as the nishiyama washerman interface orientation relationship, which shows that 110 planes are matching the 111 planes of the oxide. And as the video is going to show here, So I have recreated what this particle looks like in 3D. And what you see is that the small bubbles first nucleate at these corner facets. And as they grow, the bubbles begin to envelop the other surfaces. So this kind of information is very useful and necessary to develop computer models that accurately predict the in-service behavior of the alloys and help design future alloys. The next system I want to discuss is the depositions. So here we made large mesoscopic scale surrogate interfaces by depositing iron on a two millimeter thick single crystal of yttrium titanate. We used an electron beam system to deposit the iron, and we, or I uh, cut and oriented the surfaces 
to have 100, 110, and 111 uh, orientations. These depositions were done at 800 degrees Celsius with a deposition rate of 8 nanometers per second, leading to about 2 microns of iron total. Then we did a high temperature, low flux helium implantation into the iron layer only. Again, it's important that we only put helium in the iron because we want to see if it goes to the metal oxide interface and especially if it goes into the oxide itself. And last, we use transmission electron microscopy to observe the bubble uh, diameters, number densities, concentrations, and spectroscopy measurements to see how much helium was in the iron layer alone and how much went into the substrate. So what did these films look like? This is a scanning electron microscopy image of the surface of uh, one of these iron films. We see about three micron grains. Using electron backscatter diffraction, or EBSD, we're able to tell how each of those grains are oriented. And we see a lot of 110 iron texturing, meaning that for the uh, cubic lattices, the edges are pointing upwards. Again, this was for a deposition on 111 oxide, uh, which is also shown here. And then there is a different way to show this EBSD data. And that's by assigning a uh, color to each full 3D orientation. And what we saw are three in-plane variants. So in pink, uh, here is shown schematically, orange and blue. And we saw that the 100 directions match the threefold symmetry of the 111 oxide substrate. So again, this is what you would expect for an iron deposition on a well-oriented uh, 111 YTO substrate. Again, what is important here is that the deposited orientation relationship really is the same as what we see for the embedded nanooxides. So this is very good. We want to recreate these interfaces on a larger scale. And in this case, it was the exact same as we see for the little particles. For iron on 100, this time we saw slightly smaller, two micron grains. Using EBSD, we again saw complete 110 iron texturing. And by giving each grain the uh, color that shows its orientation, this time we saw four in-plane variants. The 111 iron in-plane directions matched with the 110 oxide directions. Again, this is expected due to the two-fold symmetry of the oxide and the two ways of uh, matching the 111 directions in iron. In this case, though, the deposited orientation relationship was different than the embedded orientation relationship. Which is, is not necessarily a bad thing. It gives us the opportunity to study a different system. It just happens to not be the exact same uh, orientation relationship that is found for the embedded nanooxides. Um, the EBSD map here this is now for iron on 110 oxide. Uh, here it would seem that the greens are pretty random. There is no clear texturing as we saw for the previous substrates. However, by plotting this data as pole figures, we clearly see that it is not random. There is some kind of pattern and structure going on. And what you see is a lot of streaks. And these pole figures indicate what is called axiotaxial texturing. So this image shows a, a TEM lift out where the iron lattice is shown on top, the oxide lattice is shown on the bottom. This is a cross section. And what you see is that the 110 iron planes 
match perfectly with the 100 oxide plane. And this leads to a fully coherent interface. But what is important about this system, uh, which leads to those streaks that I showed in the pole figures, is that this, uh, this demand to have this matching is stronger than the actual interface uh, atomic matching. So these grains, if you imagine out of plane rotations about that axis, is what causes those streaks in the pole figures. And so now that we've uh, created the bilayers and characterized them, we want to do the helium implantation. Again, the system that we're working with has a two micron electron beam iron deposition on single crystal 100, 110, and 111 substrate. There is a one micron nickel encapsulation that we put over these bilayers. And this is to prevent the helium from escaping. We're putting in the helium at 700 degrees Celsius. And unlike the alloys where the helium is trapped by the nano oxide, in this system, the helium is very mobile. And we don't want it to leave the sample. We want to know how much helium was there and where did it go. <clears throat> so the one micron of nickel was supposed to uh, keep the helium within the system. We used a 1.6 mega electron volt helium implantation uh, this was done at Los Alamos National Laboratory. Affluence of 2.6 times 10 to the 16 helium atoms per centimeter squared. And this was a 45 hour implantation done continuously. Again, we wanted to implant helium very slowly and allow it to find its sinks. So what this uh, plot is showing is the black line, the helium concentration, uh, where we put it in. And you see that we really wanted to only have the helium in the iron layer. We didn't want to force it towards the metal oxide interface. And in red shows the uh, DPA or the damage level, which so both curves are localized are around 2.4 microns into the system. So what happened? We began with oxide, iron, and a nickel coating. What we ended up getting is oxide, a nickel iron film, and big pores at the metal oxide interface. The nickel and the iron formed one continuous metallic film with half micron wide recrystallized grains, which you can see here. And we saw an average of 29 atomic percent nickel throughout the film. So we measured at each point how much nickel was present. And importantly, we did not see any nickel within the oxide substrate itself. We also saw these interfacial pores, which are two, about two microns wide, one micron tall. And well, here I'm comparing uh, different substrates, 100, 110, and 111. What we saw is that this behavior happened to all of them. All of them had these pores at the interface. Uh, this one, not so much, but this was really related to the iron thickness. The iron was a little bit uh, different between each one, and that directly correlates with the size of the pores. So this is due to what's known as the Kirkendall effect. The Kirkendall effect uh, says that uh, because the diffusion of iron is much higher than that of nickel, uh, the iron atoms want to move upwards towards the nickel side. And this is balanced by a flow of nickel downwards and a flow of extra vacancies downwards towards the metal oxide interface. And this leads to the uh, creation of these extra pores. Now, what we wanted to do is say that if we had a metal oxide interface and you put helium in, where does the helium go if you just have the iron, the oxide, and the interface? But these pores are a really great place for the helium to go into. So in a way, this experiment didn't do exactly what we wanted it to do. 
And my advisor, who was the one that we suggested we put the nickel coating on, <laughs> he said, you know, that I could blame it on him, so I will. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, regardless, uh, we still saw bubbles in the uh, in the metal layer, and what we did is took images going from the metal oxide interface all the way up to the surface. We took a series. And using red marks, we marked the helium bubble sizes and the locations. So this indicates a smaller bubble. These are larger bubbles. And the red bars indicate the depth into the sample. So these are the results. Um, on average, in the metal, we saw bubbles with an average diameter of three nanometers. This graph shows the bubble diameter as a function of distance from the interface. So this is showing at the surface. This is at the metal oxide interface at the bottom. We see a nearly constant bubble size. And this peak here is actually due to the bubbles that were found at the boundaries and at different microstructural features in the metallic film. Importantly, we did see bubbles uh, in the oxide itself up to a depth of 80 nanometers. So th this is an important finding because it shows that helium did go into the oxide as well. And for this implantation, we did not see any interface bubbles with a diameter of greater than 2 nanometers. So we could not, in the, they were not present here at the interface. Regarding the number densities of bubbles, uh, in the metallic film, we saw 2.2 times 10 to the 23rd bubbles per meters per uh, meter square, meters cube. Um, again, there's a dip here due to the presence of larger bubbles halfway through. And we saw about a similar density um, up to a depth of 80 nanometers in the oxide itself. Again, though, in the oxide, the bubbles were much, much smaller. Using a hard sphere, hard sphere equation of state, we were able to estimate the number of helium atoms in each bubble. So in a study by Yuan Wu and others, they measured and compared the helium bubble density to uh, Stoller and other hard sphere equations of state. And this model accounts for both the temperatures and the surface energies of the system. So what this model does is it tells us for a bubble of a certain size, how many helium atoms are inside of it. And for this bilayer implantation, we saw a concentration of about 500 atomic parts per million helium in these bubbles in the metallic layer. Uh, and then we saw about 50 parts per million helium in the oxide itself up to a depth of 80 nanometers. So now that we have an idea of how much helium went into the bubbles, this bilayer system allows us to see how much helium was in the different layers themselves. And we did this using uh, the mass spectroscopy. So, what I did was take one of these bilayers that has an iron film, bubbles, pores, bubbles in the oxide, and the oxide base. I first cut it in half to get two samples. I then etched away the iron film from one of the samples. And then we used isotope dilution mass spectroscopy to measure the helium contents. So we measured how much helium was in this entire package. We measured how much helium was in this, just the oxide and the bubbles. And by subtracting the two, we know how much helium was in the metallic bubbles and at the pores. So by using these two together, we were able to tell what is the actual helium partitioning for this system. 
uh, we saw that 99.3% of the helium was found in the metallic layer and in the pores. 73% of that was in bubbles, while 27% was found in these interface pores. In the oxide itself, we did measure 0.7% of the total amount of helium we put in. Again, 28% of that was in the bubbles, and the rest was di dissolved through structure itself. So also importantly, the helium that was found in the pores diffused from the oxide itself. So this experiment really indicates that helium does want to be in the oxide. So in conclusion, uh, we want to study the helium interactions with embedded oxides and with iron uh, Y2TI207 bilayers. And we did this uh, through a helium implantation. For the nanostructured ferritic alloys, we saw that helium bubbles nucleate on 111 type interfaces and grow to envelop the other oxide facets. We also saw that the bubble sizes reach about 75% of the nanooxide sizes, and the larger nanooxides can have multiple bubbles. In the bilayers, the deposited orientation relationships sometimes match the embedded orientation relationships, and sometimes they don't. And uh, for the implantation of the bilayers, the nickel encapsulation led to interfacial Kirkendall pores. We saw that 73% of the nickel was found in the bubbles in the iron, 27% was in the pores, and about 0.7% was found in the oxide substrate. So the future studies include electron energy loss spectroscopy to measure the helium densities in the bubbles and in the oxides. We really care about this inventory and knowing where the helium goes. And also, we want to make a new set of bilayers where we'll encapsulate with nickel, with, I'm sorry, with copper instead of nickel, so that we don't get a metallic alloy. Um, so I want to go through a list of acknowledgments that really uh, help make all of this work possible. Turn on the lights. Um, I really want to thank my advisor, Bob Odette, who has been very supportive of me from the beginning when I was an undergraduate and saw a lot of promise in this work or just like me personally, I don't know which it was, but, uh, but agreed to take me on as his PhD student. And I, I really appreciate Bob, everything you've taught me and from your boundless wisdom on science to uh, scientific ethic which is something else that I really am glad I will be coming away with from this whole experience. Um, I want to thank Yuan Wu, who did, who's a, a TEM specialist in our group and really did much of the TEM that I showed today and uh, was the one who worked with me side by side from the very beginning all the way to the end. In fact, she's not here today because she's doing some of the future work that I described. <laughs> Um, I want to thank everybody else in the ODET group, uh, Takuya for his wisdom and for being able to drop whatever he's doing to answer my questions uh, when I'm worried I don't understand something and I have to explain it to Bob. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I want to thank David, Kirk, and Doug for uh, a lot of what I've learned about setting up experiments and a lot of the hands-on work. Uh, Supatuk alum and the others from the ODET group who have really made this whole experience a lot of fun and uh, made it so that I really enjoyed coming to work every day. Uh, at UCSB, special thanks to Derek Stave, who's the one who taught me how to do the iron depositions. And uh, I guess also to Carlos, because this was in his lab. <laughs> and <laughs> Uh, so Derek and I worked very closely throughout the years uh, with this iron deposition system. He taught me how it works. We took it apart when I broke it. We fixed it together. 
So it was, I really owe him a lot. And uh, Garrett Stewart, who, Garrett Stewart, who taught me everything I know about EBSD, which is, I would say, my favorite uh, characterization technique. Also, uh, outside of ECSB, uh, Kurt Sikafis especially, uh, he and Bob were the ones who first sat down together and discussed this project of depositing iron on single crystal oxide. So he really, you know, gave me a good kick in the right direction, and I, I will be forever grateful to him for that. Uh, Stefan Kramer, who is now at Harvard, but who taught who taught me a lot about TEM, and the others at Los Alamos, uh, Young, who does a, a lot of the modeling for our, our interfaces, and who uh, brought me out to China to give a lecture series, and that was really a great experience. Uh, I think I'm one of the few people who actually gets to put one of their parents in these uh, acknowledgments. So my, my mom did some of the codings. Uh, both my parents are scientists at Argonne National Laboratory. And uh, my mom has facilities that I was able to use as part of my PhD. So thank you for that. Um, uh, I want to thank my PhD committee, Teresa, Carlos, and uh, Michael for their guidance and advice uh, throughout these years, and the funding by the Department of Energy Office of Fusion Energy Sciences, who are the ones who really funded this work throughout the years. And wait, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't remember this. One. Yeah, this is the most important one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God, <that's> true. Um, <laughs> so the I wanted to show some pictures of. Uh, you know, really the people that made these past years great. Uh, first and foremost, my family, Marius and Liliana, for raising me and uh, for having a lot of fun with me throughout the years and paying for trips to go visit them and vacations and everything. Uh, my little sister, Patricia, who I'm pretty sure I bother more than she would like, but <laughs> continues to support me. Uh, my girlfriend, uh, Gersharen, who has seen a lot these past three years that we've been together and uh, has stayed by my side. And uh, as you can see here, likes to teach me a lot of things. <laughs> um, my uh, class of, uh, of uh, students who, at the beginning, we would work together uh, on homework assignments, and we really taught each other a lot of material science. Uh, is this Teresa? Yeah. That's Teresa. Okay. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, also, uh, um, a lot of my friends. Uh, I really enjoyed playing soccer with all of you, along with other activities. But really, soccer has been a big uh, escape for me and something that I've looked forward to doing uh, very often every week. And uh, really, my experience would not have been the same without all of you guys. And uh, everyone else, I know, I'm sure I must have uh, forgotten people. I swear it's just because I don't have a group picture of you. So I really appreciate it. <laughs> right, with that, thank you for your time. OK, uh, there's some time for questions. Yes. Do our others look at what happened to the PKs in the scale, like where the area is? Are you talking about the, the alloys or the bilayers? Yes. So what, what we normally like to do actually is implant at very high temperature. Uh, so this on its own uh, allows the helium to find its final sink or resting site um, to see where, you know, where it's going to end up. So while some people do cold implantations, you know, to see where the helium initially goes, and then they heat it to see where it migrates to and where it ends up, we like to put it in hot. That being said, um, others have also done uh, heat treatments after the implantation itself. I was not involved in that work, though. Okay. Question? And you mentioned where mostly, you said it, but remind us where most of the healing ends up. 
Yeah, so most of the helium in the nanostructure of ferritic alloys ends up in very small interfacial bubbles, well, which is why we like these uh, alloys so much. In most materials, the helium would cluster and make voids and you know, lead to a lot of swelling. These alloys don't swell. Okay. Other questions? Well, okay. uh, yeah. so the uh, yttrium uh, titanate nano oxide that you had distributed throughout the iron matrix, how did you guys make that? So the, uh, this is done through uh, powder processing. So you begin with yttria powders and uh, TiO2 and other elements. And uh, the powders are ball milled. So the yttrium, which is very insoluble, is actually forced into your solution. And then the powders are consolidated. And when you consolidate these using hot iso isostatic pressing, the nanooxides form. So, and again, this is also other work that was done by Nicholas Cunningham and many others in our group to look at different processing variables and see what is the best I guess, recipe for getting a nanostructured ferritic alloy that has the highest number of small nanooxides and the most evenly dispersed. Other questions? Um, yes. Um, could you give me just an idea of how, what, what lifetime of these materials are going to reach? I know reactor design and so on like that. Kind of what, what are people shooting for? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Here. Okay, so um, actually, let me go back. The, I fast forward this bit. Okay, so what you're gonna see here, uh, at least in this reactor design, or in the in heater, uh, these first walls are made of plates. Uh, and these plates are meant to be replaceable. So unlike uh, some other structures where you, you build the whole structure and then you're done with it, uh, here, uh, all of these components are made to be replacement once they reach their end of life. And uh, yeah, so see the panels? So these panels are all uh, made so that you can remove them and put new ones in. Uh, that being said, the end of life goals are to have a damage level of 200 DPA. So again, DPA says that on average, each uh, atom was displaced from its site 200 times and a helium concentration of 2000 atomic parts per million. So I would say once once these conditions are met, then you would replace these cassettes and put a new one in. That's about 10 years. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> okay, other questions? All right, well, let's thank our speaker. <laughs> so um, I'm going to ask the committee to stay. We'll have a few more. Questions? Yes. Um, so please take the food, take any snacks <laughs> that you want to take with you.